Hello and welcome back to Boxing Social in association with Betfred. My name is Eamon Khan. I'm here in Box Park, London, Wembley for the Boxer Press Conference. Just concluded with me is one and only. There's magic in the air, Paulie, Mal magic man Malinaji. Paulie, how's life treating you? Good, good, good. Just a guy here from Heathrow, sat in on the press conference, talking with you lovely media guys. Life is good. Not too bad. Also hearing a little bit of Italian, I think, there as well at the press conference there on the undercard. But talk me through the card. I mean, uh, Boxer... Uh, looking to kind of, in the embryonic stages, but looking to kind of establish themselves and put on some good shows. Yeah, it's been a big year for Boxer, uh, having signed this guy's sports deal. I think they'll continue to grow the brand and uh, they'll be, uh, they'll be some, they'll, you know, now being in a position to have such a big broadcast partner, they'll be able to uh, bring up the talent in a more, in a, in a way where it can, it's more promotable. People will be able to see the talent Boxer has, and also they'll be able to sign more talent as well. So I look forward to uh, having, continuing to see Boxer grow. I've seen them grow from the beginning. I, I remember I've been with the company since uh, they first started, and uh, it's been really uh, incredible to watch them blossom to this point. Uh, ben Shalom's done a great job uh, thus far, and I think, uh, you know, sky's really the limit now when you make this, you've made this kind of deal with Sky Sports. You were someone in your career who was never afraid to kind of speak, be out there, be themselves. In a boxing world where there's more and more people put on more and more shows, where competition is more and more uh, bigger than it's ever been, how important is, is it to be innovative and different in the boxing world? You've got to be innovative, you've got to be different, but you've also got to not, it doesn't just stop at that, you've also got to put out quality. Regardless of innovative and different, the bottom line is you've got to have quality out there. And I think Boxer having this platform with Sky now gives himself a, an opportunity to create more quality, uh, uh, give themselves a chance to have better content uh, that can be viewed by a, a wide, wider, broader audience. And that will also make more young prospects and more fighters want to sign with the company. Let's talk to me about the main event here, Richard Rackport, against a very interesting opponent when the opponent was announced, Duradola. Uh, it piqued a lot of interest of uh, people who are on social media with Duradola, the experience and the, the knockout power that it brings as well. Tough test for someone like Richard. Yeah, Duradola is an ex-world title challenger. Uh, probably will be coming in a little bit pissed off now that the guy he lost for the world title is fighting Canelo. He's just going to feel like he could have been him fighting Canelo. Instead, he's got a tough fight like Riakpour in front of him for a lot less money, right? So, so I think uh, it's, it's a good test for Riakpour, uh, ex-world title challenger. Anytime you start to fight those ex-world title challengers, you know you're going to start to fight those ex-champions and champions very soon after. You know, it's kind of the progression point. So uh, it, you can already start to see how Riakpour's name will be compared to other champions. For example, if he's able to overcome Duradola, the, the, the comparison will come to how did Makabu handle Duradola as opposed to how did Riakpur handle Duradola. So when you start getting those comparisons, you start to automatically become part of the conversation and fighting those kind of guys as well. So um, exciting times for Riakpur. He's done a great job of you know, climbing the ladder uh, steadily. Uh, he's got a great story and uh, he's a guy who I think is going to become very promotable if he, keep, if he can keep on winning the way he's been winning. You mentioned there about uh, the cruiserweights. Canelo's kind of made that, well, potentially making that move up to cruiserweight to fight Ilunga Makabu there. Very interesting move. If it uh, comes off and plays off there, what's your reaction to it? An interesting move. Uh, I didn't see it coming, but then again, I wasn't really paying attention to the cruiserweight division. Uh, but when you look at it now, with hindsight being 2020, it's, kind of, it's not that bad of an, of an idea, you know, because at light heavyweight, you've got a bunch of monster punchers. You've got Joe Smith, you've got Dimitri Bebo, you've got Arthur Better Bebo, all can knock your block off, you know? And, um, you know, Canelo would have to go up and wait to fight punchers from those weight classes. You skip over and you find this lowly WBC world champion at cruiserweight who's maybe not as dangerous. Even if he's bigger, he might not be as dangerous. Nonetheless, you have to stop playing checkers, I mean, chess, not checkers, when you move up this many weight classes because you're naturally smaller and so you're going to be dealing with a lot, the, the bigger size difference as well as the skill level of a world-class fighter. So I, I don't, I, I think it's actually an intelligent move. I, I've been, I've done a few other interviews. I've compared it to Pernod Whitaker's move when he fought Julio Cesar Vasquez instead of like Terry Norris uh, when he moved us up to super welterweight. I can kind of see it being this, a similar situation here. You can't keep fighting the best guy at every weight class no matter what weight class you move up in. This is uh, not a board game. This is not a video game. This is real life and you put yourself at risk. So I think the Macabre move is pretty intelligent when you look at the punches that are at our, our light heavyweight. And in the meantime, you can kind of let the light heavyweight assess and adjust itself while you try to uh, uh, conquer the cruiserweight division with a, with a WBC win. Well, I just want to delve into that a slight bit more because people online debating as to whether this is a 
looking at Makabu and saying he's probably the weakest of the champions, might be a quote-unquote, I don't want to use the phrase, but they, they use the phrase cherry-pick when you have other fighters and other divisions who could yeah, pose you challenges. Can't, you can't call it a cherry-pick when it's five weight classes up. I mean, it's, it's, every fight is dangerous at that point. You know, you can't expect a guy to go up five weight classes and then also keep fighting the best guys in every weight class. I know the Pacquiao career kind of ruined it for everybody, and that's what they want to see, the best guy to fight the best weight guy in every single weight class you go up in. But if, if you have any intelligence in your, in your head, you probably know that's not really reality unless you, you know, there's a lot of other things going on that I'm not going to get into because I'm sick of dealing with it. But, you know, I, in reality, it, 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 it's, it's hard to keep going up that many weight classes and, 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 and keep fighting the best guy. And then you're going to get called the cherry picker too. I mean, I don't know, bro. Was Hagler a cherry picker because he stayed in one weight class for eight years? I mean, come on. I, I, I don't know. I, I just think the... The, the media and the fans have gotten dumber instead of getting smarter, you know? Like, Hagler's appreciated for staying in the same weight class for eight years and having had all those defenses. Now, not only are you supposed to go up, you gotta keep fighting the best guys in every single weight class you go up in. Like, this is, this is not just not natural. Um, I was already thinking it's putting himself at risk at light heavyweight. I think he puts himself at less risk at cruiserweight, but it's, a, it's an intelligent move because you pick off another world championship. Um, I, I, I think it's a good move for him. I think it's a smart. I think it's the smarter move for him. Boxer Carl, when it finishes on the night, uh, leads off into a very interesting fight that's also on Sky Sports. That being uh, Terence Crawford versus Sean Porter. A lot of people are citing this as Terence Crawford's toughest test, and potentially might be someone who upsets Terence Crawford. There, your take? You can't um, overlook Sean Porter. He's always a guy who lives uh, the sport. Um, he lives by making you completely uncomfortable and suffering there. And, uh, in a really ugly fight and especially guys who are used to fighting in a pretty boxing style like Crawford sometimes it can really take them off their game plan and Porter loves to do that and he tends to do that to guys but I compare this fight uh, if I look at an opponent on Crawford's record then Crawford's resume and Crawford's ledger that you can compare here it's the Jeff Horn fight Horn also lived by making fights very ugly very physical very very demanding uh, 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 of a pace inside the ring and then sort of would take you off your you know pretty boxing style rhythm and Crawford handled that to me surprisingly, surprisingly very, very well, you know. Uh, dominated that fight more than I could have ever expected him to. So, and when I look at that fight, it, it bodes well for Crawford, uh, the way he'll handle Porter. I think Porter is probably a bit more skilled than Horn, but let's face it, Horn was a good fighter. Horn was also a bigger fighter. So in terms of using that physical style, Horn had even more size at his disposal, disposal to use, and still Crawford was able to handle him. So I'm very curious to see what Porter can do. Uh, it's going to be more than physicality. You think of Porter, you think of the physicality and the pace that he brings more than anything else. But he's going to have to bring a certain amount of skill to offset Crawford and not just that physical demanding style. Because uh, if the Jeff Horn fight told, taught us anything about Crawford, it's that the, the physicality doesn't bother him and he'll handle it. Paulie, I know I'm slightly overstepping the gun a little bit here, but should Terence Crawford come out with a victory over Sean Porter, are there any question marks really that you can put over Terence Crawford after he, if he does get that win? I mean, no, not really. I mean, he's out of opponents to fight. I mean, really, he's out of he's he's out of guys that that you know you're going to test them with. Errol Spence coming back from a detached retina. I, I don't. I, I think that's going to be a problem for Errol. Honestly, that's that's not an easy uh, injury to overcome. Right now, Crawford's head and shoulders above the rest. Fair enough. Um, and then another thing I just want to get your thought on as well is uh, obviously big news over here. Um, didn't White didn't quite get the order he wanted mandated of the WBC convention citing arbitration reasons as to why they couldn't order it. Just your thoughts on that one too. Yeah, I think it's one of the tragedies of this generation in boxing is Dillian White not fighting for a, a world championship ever in his career. I mean, that's that's brutal. That's ludicrous. It's absolutely insane to me. But um, he's got to wait more now. I don't know. I, politics and sports tend to suck. Let's bring it back to the card. Boxer, got a night of action coming up this weekend. People tuning in, what can I expect to see? I think you can expect to see a lot of fun and a lot of fireworks. Listen, Boxer has... A lot of, a, a stable of young, hungry fighters that I think will make a big name for themselves in the coming years. And I think the platform, uh, having had the marriage with Sky Sports, as I talked about when I was on the podium, I think it will create opportunities to really grow and, 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 and give these prospects a chance to turn into contenders and champions, and be able to blossom right in front of uh, the, the fan base and really be able to pay attention to them and follow them for years to come because they'll get a chance to really have seen these guys from the very beginning and from even before they were champions. I think Boxer has done a good job of signing a lot of young talent and there's a, a potentially very bright future for a, a lot of the fighters on this table.
Well, quickly, something that's coming to my mind, I apologise, uh, I know I said it was the last question. Uh, time for Fury is Jake Paul. I know you sort of embedded in that well with the Corey B kind of situation that you had going on there. I uh, just wanted to get your take on this sort of fight because it's now a, a YouTuber versus, or let's say, a YouTuber boxer turned against someone who is uh, a boxer now in Tommy Fury. How do you see, do you feel, do you feel that dynamic, dynamic changes the stakes for Jake Paul there? I don't see Tommy Fury as a boxer. I thought he was. I mean, I, I thought the, the, the Fury last name made him like Huey or like Tyson where, you know, you can you watch those guys box and you can tell they have a pedigree. Um, I didn't know Tommy Fury from Adam. You know, I didn't know anything about him. I just knew he was Tyson Fury's brother, so I assumed he was, you know, in the same mechanism as the Fury family of boxers when they, he would have a, he had a pedigree. And so for that reason, I when I was hearing about him, I said, no, there's no way Jake Paul would fight a, a boxer like this, you know? And then I watched him fight on the last Jake Paul fight, and I realized this guy's actually not a boxer. I mean, I, there's no way that guy's a boxer. That guy, that guy has a Fury last name. And then I start to realize, you do the diligence and research, he's a reality star. He's a reality guy who just has a Fury name. He's in a family of boxers. He himself wasn't a boxer, but he started boxing, definitely started boxing late. There's no way he's got the same pedigree as his, the rest of his family. You can see he's still uncomfortable in there. He, he, he looks very academic. Um, he's not a boxer. He has the last name. And so he's... he's and not to not to not to take anything away from him because he's probably just as much of a boxer as Jake Paul is, but I wouldn't say it's Jake Paul versus a boxer. I wouldn't say it's Jake Paul fighting his first boxer opponent. This is a Jake Paul, a reality star turned boxer, versus Tommy Fury, a reality star turned boxer. That's all it is. It's just two guys who were reality guys in their own respective regions and countries, and they've uh, both turned boxer. That's all it is. Just one of them happens to be from a boxing family, so you think he's a boxer. But in reality, he's a reality shot. He's a reality guy. With that said, then, a lot of people on these shores are picking Tommy Fury to get the victory. Uh, I, I'm actually hearing a lot of people in the U.S. picking Tommy Fury. I mean, he's got a, an ace up his sleeve. He's got his brother Tyson. And I've seen some videos and stuff. He's, he's helping him train, and he's, he's involved in camp. I mean, Jake has a lot to work on. So does Tommy. But, you know, I think Tommy has a, a big uh, motivation uh, in having Tyson with him. Um, Jake doesn't have any dummies around him either. BJ Flores is a smart guy, and I think they'll have him ready as well. But I think it's a legitimate 50-50 fight. But I don't, I wouldn't consider it Jake fighting a boxer. I mean, it's Jake the reality star turned boxer versus Tommy the reality star turned boxer. That's all it is. I mean, am I wrong? It's, it's, it's what it is. Let's call it how we see it, no? Well, at least I leave it there. Pleasure speaking to you. Thank you for speaking to Boxing Social. Much appreciated. Thank you, Thank you so much.